I appreciate uh, the members of Parliament who are still in the House. Uh, this uh, slide shows the pillars of safe motherhood. This is what Kenya adopted from WHO. And, and you can see that pregnancy, uh, family planning and pre-pregnancy care is one of the main pillars of safe motherhood. So women do need to be prepared to be ready to give birth to the next child if they are going to survive it. Uh, this shows the, the contraceptive preference rate over time. Uh, we've made significant uh, uh, progress as a country, if you look at where we used to be, um, from 17% to the current in 2009 during the census, we showed 46% of the women uh, using, uh, met, uh, using family planning. But ladies and gentlemen, this is in the 21st century, and less than half of women who need family planning are not using. So we need to ask ourselves, is this good enough? And we can compare ourselves with our contemporaries. In the 60s, late 60s and the early 70s, we were together with the Singapore, South Korea, and others. If you look at the contraceptive preference rate of South Korea today is 80%. So you can see also how their development uh, links with this. Singapore is 62%, and our counterpart, Morocco, is 67%. In the late 60s, we were at the same rate. Going through the trends in total fertility rate, these are the, number of, the average number of children each woman has. We've also come a long way as Kenya. You can see in 78, women were getting on average eight children. Uh, currently, the latest DHS in 2009 showed that we are about five children per woman, five children per woman. This is still a burden, I believe. There are not many of us who can take our children through school, through university, uh, comfortably, even though sitting in this room. So imagine the Mwanainji in the rural areas having five children and trying to educate them to change their, their status as a, as a family. It becomes a very big burden. And I must say that those days when the trend was uh, going in the right direction, there was a lot of commitment, political commitment, which we are seeing in this room and we are seeing in the current government. A lot of IEC activities were happening on the ground. In fact, whenever you turn right or left, you could hear family planning messages. There was also increase in the services uh, within our facilities. I think family planning services then in the MCH was one service which you would not miss uh, when a woman goes to the MCH clinic. I remember as a young doctor, when I missed gloves or lacked gloves in the theater or in the labor ward, I knew I would find sterile gloves in the MCH clinic for family planning. And I used to have good relations with the midwives offering family planning because they never used to lack these supplies. I think the situation has gone a whole 360 over the years, and you find that the midwives, the doctors who are trying to offer these services are offering under very difficult conditions. So when we compare ourselves again with our contemporaries, like Morocco, if you look at the number of children they, are, they were having in 2009, it's about 2.6, about three children per woman. Singapore have gone even beyond the, the, the expected, they're at 1.2, and South Korea was at 1.2. So it looks like along the way, we lost this uh, as a country, and we need to find out what was that which was making us do well. Because we do need to reach a point where the, number, the numbers we have uh, we can be able to really take care of them, individually as a family and also collectively as a country. Even as we talk about contraceptive uh, being 46%, it, it has a lot of uh, implications according to education, which means the poor remain poorer, they have worse indicators, and so the circle of poverty continues. If you look at that slide, the contraceptive preference rate among women with no education was only 12%. And the ones with the secondary education and above was 52%. This was in 2009. 
So it means that if we educate our women and boys and, 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 and girls, then they are likely to be able to uptake family planning in the future so that they can be able to manage uh, their individual families and collectively as a country. So education is really key. We need to keep the girls and boys in school. I think these trends have been uh, mentioned uh, by others before me. But I just wanted to, to, to tell ourselves, you know, we are in the East African region and Kenya, uh, we, we pride ourselves in being the giant in the region. But let me just tell you, currently, the maternal mortality in Rwanda is at 320, much lower than ours at 488. In Eritrea, with all their issues there, it's at 360. So uh, we didn't do have a lot of work to do as a country in terms of really reaching the targets there. The 148 in 2015 was what had been put in the reproductive health policy and strategy. 2015 is a few months from now. Maybe we, we really do have a lot of work. We've just been told by Dr. Aya the target now is 132. Uh, so uh, we really do urge all of us in our respective ways, and especially the parliamentarians who are with us today, to really look at how we can accelerate this process so that we can save our women and, and children. Dr. Keegan has told us what kills women. We know what kills women. And most of these are things which are preventable. We are talking of too early. These are the adolescent girls who are being married off at age of 9, 12, because they have been cut and hence are women to be married off to either old men or others. They are not ready to be mothers. So all these complications are much uh, enhanced in these young girls. Too many pregnancies, too many pregnancies. We say the average number of uh, children and women in Kenya are getting is about five, 4.6, but we know it ranges between counties and the, the, count, the 15 counties we are talking about have an average of about six to seven children per woman. So these things do go together because the more frequently a woman gets pregnant, she gets weaker, she's not ready for the next pregnancy, and then she starts off on the bad uh, side of her health. You can see here the leading causes, abortion, bleeding, and infections. This in the 21st century should not be killing anybody because we know what it takes to avoid uh, dying from bleeding. We know, as doctors who are in the room, we know what we can do as a country. We know what we should do. Abortion is a big debate for another day, especially unsafe abortions. What are, why are our children getting pregnant when they are so young? What do they know? What don't they know? What should we do so that they are prepared and not getting into situations of getting into unsafe abortions? So those figures we've been talking about, I think there have been, there have been many an analogies. For me, I, I just thought, you know, when this uh, KQ Dreamliner was being uh, presented, it was all fanfare and so forth. I'm told it seats about 600 people. So I'm imagining now 10 of them crashing 10 of them crashing every year, because that's what about 6,000 means. Yeah, that's a thought. Just imagine even one of them crashing, not even 10, just one. You can imagine the number of uh, the reaction, the task forces which would be put in place to address these issues. But <coughs> these 10 jets crashing are happening. They are happening today, they are happening in Taita Taveta, they are happening in Bere, they are happening in Migori, they are happening all over the place. These uh, women, in poor situations, most of them may be delivering at home without skilled attendance. So they are just numbers. But I think, uh, parliamentarians, these are your, the people who vote for you. So I think it's important that we see how we can be able to avoid this kind of catastrophe. And like the UNFP representative said, Kenya is one of the 10 most dangerous countries to be giving birth. You know, if you compare the, the chances of dying when you give birth in Kenya, it's one in 22. Again, it's one in 8,000 in other countries. Really, in the 21st century, this is not acceptable. 
the Constitution has given uh, rights to reproductive health care, and I think we need to see how to actualize that as a reality. So how does family planning save lives? You know, when I, 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 I stood, I was discussing this area, it's like family planning is how can it save life? We are saying that women who have mistimed and planned, whatever you call it, a pregnancy for which they are not ready for, they start off on the bad side of the scale. Many will not, will decide I will not go through this pregnancy, come rain, come sunshine. And they will find all modalities of getting rid of that pregnancy through safe or unsafe ways. So the main problem, the backbone of the deaths is the unintended pregnancy situation. Also for those who choose to continue with the pregnancy since it's, it's a gift from God or it's come, whatever, it's another child, you find most of them will not go to the clinic, they are near to clinic because they are already in a status of denial or depression and, and so forth. And we know even in a normal pregnancy, 10 to 15% of pregnancies go wrong. So when these women do not even attend clinic uh, because they did not intend to have that baby at that time, then the chances are actually increased a lot more. So between the, uh, the unsafe abortions and the lack of care, it means that if we could avoid this by making sure that women get pregnant when they are ready, so that we are not talk, talking about unplanned and so forth. WHO projects that 30 to 35 percent of maternal deaths can be averted through family planning. So we make sure that women get pregnant when their bodies are ready, their minds are ready, and their partners are also ready for the baby. That can save 30 to 35 percent of, of deaths. If we talk money, UNFPA projects that for every one US dollar invested in family planning, we save about 31 uh, US dollars for the health sector. So for the economists, maybe it's good to look at why don't we invest in this cheap way to save the bigger uh, cake. Studies done in Kenya showed that investing 5.3 billion Kenya shillings in the family planning program would save the country about 20 billion Kenya shillings in the areas of education, immunization, water and sanitation, and the maternal health, and also managing malaria in pregnancy and in children. So the ripple effects of family planning should be obvious. I mean, that's what we think, but we know we are in a situation where it's not as obvious as we think. Timing of pregnancy to ensure the health of mother and baby, I believe every couple wants to, to do that. But we know the situation on the ground. Cause increasing birth interval reduces complications of both the mother and baby. Empowering women so that they are also able to engage in economic activities. Because when a woman is pregnant every, every year, you know, they even become a burden to themselves, live alone to, to the families. Women are very productive. They, are very, they have a lot of um, uh, innovations. But when we keep them tied to their breastfeeding, either pregnant or breastfeeding, they cannot be able to engage in economic activities. And finally, for HIV-infected uh, couples, we know that there is a window of, getting, of being able to get uh, a negative uh, child if they conceive when the viral load is very low. And this can only be managed if they are actually um, uh, having um, a way of preventing the pregnancy through family planning. So in conclusion, uh, honorable members, I, I just want to say that investing in family planning is a cost-effective way of reducing deaths and complications. This is evidence-based. It is not uh, Kupa Yuka. Increase, so we need to increase certain things like when Dr. Keegan presented issues of delivering women, saving women's lives, 
requires human resource. Then if we were to invest in technology, ICT, or robots, they will not do a cesarean section. They will not deliver a woman. We need a midwife. And especially in the front line, uh, health facilities, the dispensaries, the health centers, where most of the women in the rural areas access. So there's definitely a need for more resources for the health sector to manage some of these very key areas. So my call to all the honorable members in the room is political commitment to end these this unnecessary deaths of women and newborns by investing in the health sector. Family planning commodities right now are in between cracks. As we devolved the health sector, the national government does not have a budget line for family planning. The counties are saying the resources are not enough to put family planning as one of their uh, um, activities. So we are reaching a situation where we will not have any commodities in the countries. And as we move towards the budgeting process, this is an area I would really wish the parliamentarians, the Senate, everybody, the civil society to keep in mind because family planning does save life. Also resources from the local levels, I believe the counties, the members of parliament know that at the local levels, we can be able to raise resources and support ourselves as a nation at that level. We'd want to see that happening a lot more as we move to and serve sustainability as a country. And finally, promoting community for, uh, mobilization for positive behavior, health-seeking behavior. Uh, honorable members, we know that uh, our people don't go to the clinics for various reasons. would want you to take responsibility to make sure that those clinics are ready for our, mem our communities and tell them, that, give them the right information because they listen to you. I know there have been uh, politics of numbers and, and so forth, but we know at the end of the day, the woman or child or adolescent who dies is your voter today, not in 18 years. I thank you for your attention.